All right, welcome back to Resilient Voices and Beyond. I'm so excited for today's episode. I have a, a dear friend, a brother on today. Um, but before I get into all that, you know, I just want to give my thanks and my gratitude for all the people that are supporting me and supporting this podcast and this movement of Resilient Voices and Beyond all together. Truly could not be here and doing this work and having this platform or the coffee and conversations, you know, without you guys. And also a special thanks to all the guests that I've had on before and the work that they're doing. I hope that you guys continue to follow them and continue to see, you know, the good things that other people are out there doing within their platforms. Um, if you so happen to have stumbled across my podcast and don't know who I am, you know, my name is Michael D. Davis Thomas, a.k.a. MDDT Speaks, and yes, it is my initials. I uh, spent a little bit over 11 years in the Michigan child welfare system. I've uh, done a lot of different work within the child welfare system, around 10 years of advocacy and working around um, the child welfare system. So, I'm glad to be here and sharing my experience, but also holding this platform for others to be able to uplift their experience and the work that they're doing. With that being said, you guys know I can talk. I'm not going to talk your ears off. I'm going to have my guest introduce himself. Okay. Um, thanks for having me, uh, Michael. I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, my name is Aylin Stamps. I'm founder and executive director for River Jordan. And... Um, that's basic. That's basically it. I'm glad to have you. Uh, it's this has been a long time coming. A long time coming, but I'm gonna dive right into it because I'm excited for this. Episode. Um, those that don't know, me and Al have a long relationship, you know, working together and just, you know, advocating together and so forth. But I'm excited to take a back seat from being his partner, you know, to being a person that's just interviewing him and capturing his story and all the great work that he's doing. Um, with that being said, my first initial question is kind of getting that background to build the timeline of your individual life and the great work that you're doing. So to your earliest experience, when did this all begin for you? Uh, you're talking about my experience in foster care or experience? Yes, with, when you, you entered know, into care. care. Okay, yeah. um, so um, I was two years old at the time. My mother, she was a young mother. Um, she she was on heroin it was a you know it was kind of like today is a heroin heroin epidemic and um so she was on heroin and uh she got addicted to it and she just you know she was hanging out with friends and stuff like that and she would take me wherever she you know would hang out and um sometimes she needed to go and hustle or do whatever she had to do and she was notorious for leaving me with people um, and a lot of times the people that she didn't know, you know, that she might have said, OK, my son might be safe here. And she was telling people, hey, I'm going to go to the store real quick and I'll be right back. I just need to leave my son here and, you know, I'll be right back. But sometimes she wouldn't come back for, you know, hours and sometimes days. So she left me with a person and um, she left me with someone. And that person, you know, uh, wasn't an wasn't an addict. Uh, she left me with someone, and I think it was about two or three days before this person finally said, "You know what? I need to drop this kid off somewhere because I don't know if this kid's mom is coming back." So this person took me over to my grandmother's house and left me on the front porch and sped off. And um, my grandmother, she lived on a dead end road and there was a lot of kids on the road. So it was very uncommon to hear a car speeding down the street. So there were so many kids there. And um, so when she heard the noise from the tires, she came out to the front and there I was sitting on the porch. I was dirty, my nose was running. I was kind of a snide nose kid. Um, my hair was nappy, not combed and stuff like that. So she brought me in, cleaned me up and everything like that. And a couple of days later, CPS knocked on her door looking for my mother. Uh, my grandmother couldn't, you know, give an account for my mother's whereabouts. Um, she didn't know what was going on. Um, you know, my grandmother didn't lie for my mom either. Uh, so she just basically said, hey, I don't know where she's at. And uh, from there, a CPS case 
uh, abuse and neglect case was open. I was a neglect case. Um, so I stayed with my grandmother for about six years. But throughout the, those six years, I developed some uh, pretty serious uh, mental health and behavioral problems. Um, and it was mostly because my mother would, you know, come in every now and then and she would promise me things like, you know, hey, we're going to get our own place soon and we're going to, you know, I'm going to come and get you and, and just stuff like that, you know, uh, making promises about holidays and gifts and all this kind of stuff and she wouldn't follow through. Um, and mainly what broke my heart was my mother's promises for, you know, coming to get me so I can be with her, you know, forever. Um, I, I, you know, just being honest with you, my, my grandmother, um, she worked at U of M hospital. She, you know, made a decent income. We lived on a, on a nice block. I was spoiled. Uh, my grandmother took really good care of me. My uncle and my aunts lived there. They took care of me. But at the end of the day, I just wanted to be with my mother. I had a really, really strong attachment to her. And, um, you know, my behavior began to escalate where I started get to get violent. And so I was, you know, I would throw temper tantrums and throw stuff around and stuff like that whenever I would get angry. Um, and then after a while, my anger started, you know, I started um, diverting that anger to myself. I started, um, you know, saying I hate myself and I want to kill myself and all this kind of stuff. And I would hurt myself by throwing myself against the wall, banging my head on the floor and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it got to the point where I just got too big. And on one Christmas day, um, one, one Christmas evening, uh, when I was eight years old, my, my mom, you know, she had made me promises leading up to Christmas that she was going to be there and everything. And so that Christmas day, she didn't, she didn't show up. Um, I had a lot of gifts that day from a lot of different people, uh, my aunts and my uncle, and my grandmother and people in my family. You know, I just got extra stuff. I got extra stuff because they understood my situation. I was kind of that special kid. So I got, kind of got special treatment. Um, but I, you know, I was looking forward to my mother being there and she wasn't there. Um, and she did promise me a gift, but it really wasn't about the gift. Although I was looking around the house frantically that night for the gift, um, it wasn't really about that. It was about her not being there. And, um, you know, as I was running around the house looking for the gift, my, my grandmother started to get increasingly worried. And, um, and, you know, I do remember, throwing a huge temper tantrum and my grandmother was trying to restrain me my uncle and my aunts they were gone they were out visiting friends for Christmas and it was just me and her and she was trying to hold me down and I got away from her and hit her in the mouth and busted her lip and there was blood on the floor and um, she just ran in her room shut the door called the police and the police came over um, police officer got out the car, came in the house and grabbed me and, um, you know, he, he uh, sat on me on the, on the couch and um, until I, until I calmed down. And uh, so after that, um, he started talking to my grandmother and pulled her to the side. He put me in the police car and I stayed in the police car for a little bit. Um, next thing I know, he was taking me out of the police car. He took me in the house. And by then I was calm. Um, but about an hour later, my grandmother had put me in the car with some suitcases that she packed. And um, she drove me to my first placement. And that was uh, Christmas night. It was a residential group home. It was a bunch of boys. It was called St. Francis Home for Boys. So there was a lot of boys there. There was nuns walking around that were kind of giving aid to the kids and there were plain clothes staff there that was there to pretty much maintain order. Um, and so I stayed there for a while. I, I think I think I, I didn't really uh, I didn't really think that it was uh, a long term. I thought it was just temporary because of my behavior. I thought, you know, okay, this is where kids go when they get in trouble. 
that's what I thought. And, you know, as days went by, um, I just started to notice that, you know, my mom's not coming to get me. My grandmother's not coming to get me. And there was my temper tantrums all over again. I just couldn't hold it together. Um, and my temper tantrums were so bad that St. Francis decided that they couldn't take care of me. They couldn't, um, they couldn't meet my needs. So they sent me to this uh, mental, kind of a mental hospital, mental health hospital for young kids um, who were uh, court ward or, or state ward. Um, so I ended up there, it was a place called Hawthorne, Hawthorne Center in, in Novi, I think it was, or Livonia. So I ended up there and this place had a quiet room. It had, you know, padded rooms in the quiet room. Um, the, the staff were trained to restrain. Um, there were uh, psychiatrists that could prescribe psychotic medications on staff. There were all these different people there. And, you know, whenever I throw my temper tantrum, whenever my mom wouldn't pick me up for home visits, that's where I would be. And, um, you know, they would give me, they would try to give me medications. I would spit them back out and I would stay in the quiet room until, um, until I was, you know, took my meds. And so I'd take my meds and then I would calm down and I would come out. And that just kind of went on for a long time um, until my behavior was managed. And then uh, my mother got herself together. She had, you know, got some clean time and pleased the courts. And I went back home to her when I was 13 or 12, I think I was either 11 or 12. I went back home to her and um, she, she relapsed shortly after uh, it was, I mean, it wasn't very long. That's what I remember. I can't really give a time, but it wasn't very long until she relapsed. And uh, once she relapsed, everything just started going downhill. You know, we went from a nice place to a mediocre place to, now we're back in the hood. So we're back in the hood and she's out using gone days at a time. And um, so she came home one day on, on, a, on a winter, on a winter uh, evening, she came home and I was sitting there looking at TV. I think I had my shorts on, just kind of relaxing or whatever. And uh, she came in and uh, she was upset. And um, she said something to me, I can't remember what it was, but I remember that I talked back. I opened up my mouth to my mom and probably said something I shouldn't have said. And um, there, there we was in, you know, in the fight. And she, she ran to the kitchen and got a knife. And um, cause I had grabbed, she tried to hit me with the belt. I grabbed the belt, yanked it out of her hand and she ran to the kitchen, grabbed a knife. And then there I was, I took off, ran down the block to the police station in my shorts. Um, no socks, no, <laughs> no t-shirt, no nothing, just my shorts, ran out to the police station and, um, they took me back to Hawthorne and, um, her rights were, my mother's rights were terminated from that point. And so that started my whole stint, um, you know, through the foster care system. I was in over 20 different placements over 11 year span. Um, it just, you know, it was, I was in various placements. I was in a lot of residential group homes because that's where I was comfortable at. I really wasn't comfortable with foster homes, um, because they were not my mom, not my dad. Um, and I just, I just really had a, I don't know. I think I just had a, I had no real point of reference on what family looked like. Um, I kind of thought I knew what it looked like, but my, my grandmother was a single parent. Um, she was gone all the time. Um, my aunt, my aunts and my uncle were there, but you know, that wasn't, it just wasn't what I was used to. It was a lot of love going on at these foster homes and, you know, the mother and father were there. It was just kind of like a sitcom show kind of stuff that I just wasn't used to. And, um, you know, and then also, you know, I would, I kind of, you know, I had an attachment disorder 
So whenever I would go to, you know, start having feelings for these foster parents, I would just kind of lose it. I would do things that would just self-sabotage the, the relationship. I would run away or I would cuss out the parents. I would do something. And it wasn't something that I was doing consciously. It was just stuff that subconsciously I just did, you know, to sabotage the relationship. And, um, you know, that that was the reason why I was always in all these different places, because I would behave well in the in the group homes and I would create, uh, you know, complete the level systems and they had to put me somewhere. So, that, you know, they put me in a foster home and then I would get there. Then I would escalate in my behaviors and then I would end up going back, you know, to a residential. And then so it was, it was a constant cycle that I was going through. Um, then I aged out of foster care. I was in an SIL, Supervised Independent Living Home. I aged out of foster care from there. Um, I was just doing things I wasn't supposed to do at that SIL. It could have worked out for me, but I didn't take advantage of any of the opportunities that were given to me. Um, you know, the social workers were trying to get me ready for college and, you know, helping me find a job and getting me ready for, you know, to be on my own and teaching me life skills and stuff like that. But I was too busy out, you know, um, using drugs and experimenting and smoking weed and drinking and stuff like that. I just wasn't following the rules. And at that point, I was 18 years old. And, you know, they said, hey, you know, um, there's nothing else here left for you. The SIL supervisor of the placement doesn't want you there anymore uh, because you're not following the rules. So, you know, we, we have no choice but to let you go. Um, and then I was, you know, homeless, you know, with the clothes on my back and whatever I had in my little bag. And, uh, you know, I was out on the streets. And so uh, within, I don't know, within two years, I committed enough little petty crimes and stuff like that, that it eventually landed me in prison. And so before I you, did, Before yeah. you navigate, you know, deep into, you know, your adulthood, I want to, you know, touch base on this transition period from, you know, the, your adolescence to this, you know, uh, transition period into an adulthood. You touched on a lot, you know. On I first and foremost, I want to say I appreciate your honesty and your openness and your vulnerability sharing. You know, yeah. <laughs> sharing this, you know, with us today. Um, one thing that stuck out to me is from your early experience. You know, um, there was a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of trauma, and it, and it, I, I don't think it was knowing, but, you know, being left somewhere, you know, as a kid, you know, you entrust that your parent, you know, is putting you in the right place, but, you know, I, I can only assume, you know, and knowing you, I, I know, but, you know, some of those places wasn't safe, you know? Right, right yeah. Um, and anybody have been somewhere, you know, you, you get the feeling when you know you ain't in a safe place, mm -hmm. but, um, Luckily, you know, um, and I say luckily lightly, you know, um, you got dropped off at the one person's house and um they knew enough to drop you off, you know, at your grandmother's house. Yeah. Um, but at that point, is it safe to say the reality that you had about your life and what your mom had been so conformed that you wasn't willing to let anyone else in, you know. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, that's definitely safe to say. I wasn't, I just wanted my mom. That's, mm -hmm. I don't know why. I, I don't. Um, I don't know if that's, uh, uh, you know, that's just built into the, to the, uh, you know, the mindset of a baby or a child. I don't know if that's, but I had a real deep attachment to my mom. Even though I was spoiled, I love my grandmother. I loved, you know, all of my family members, but at the end of the day, it was just her I wanted. Mm -hmm. At an early age, you survived a lot with her. Yeah. You yeah. know? <laughs> and yeah. So you, so that, you know, so y'all were there for each other, you know, so ration, rationally, it makes sense, you mm -hmm. know. Um, 
And you spoke about, you know, being with your grandmother, you know, and your grandmother being a solid, stable adult, you know. Um, but unfortunately, you know, because of the mental state that you were in and still wanting and hopeful that mom would come around, you know, um, that didn't take, which happens a lot. It, you know, <laughs> it happens a lot in which I'm excited to have you on because, you know, we have a lot of people who enter into care of no fault of their own, you know, but also, you know, we have people who are on both sides of that. You know, there's no fault of their own, but also their behaviors have led them into the system. Too. And that's me. That was me right there, Michael. Um, I, didn't, I don't mean to cut you off, but you know, you there's, two part, there's two parts to this. Um, I played a part of being in a residential, but the, the part where I went into foster care or CPS was called and stuff like that, that was not my fault. Mm -hmm. But I had, I could have, you know, I could have had a nice upbringing. Mm -hmm. and, and I was in a safe place and I was in a good place around loving people, but my actions got me into that residential. Mm -hmm. You know? I I want to ask, you know, following that, because you, you, you talk about at an early age, really having a low perspective of yourself because of your mom not being there and that, you know, building up self-harm tendencies and, and everything. What, if I can, you know, and I'm really asking in a general sense of other people out there, uh, what was your thought process in that time? You know, when when you would have those feelings and those emotions, what um, what were you thinking? You know, if it's fair to ask, that I was a piece of crap. You know, um, that I was worthless. That I was that I was ugly. That I was uh, uh, had no talent. That I, you know. I, I, my, my self-esteem was so low that I wouldn't even try to play sports with other kids, mm -hmm. you know, because I just didn't think I had the, the talent to even play, to even give it a try. Like my low self-esteem stopped me from trying to do anything. And if I did try to do something, it would be with other kids that, um, that, that I knew that, you know, I, it would be with the other kids that didn't get picked to be on teams, you know. So, like, if we're, we were, there was this field, we would always, you know, the kids would always play kickball and all that kind of stuff. And I would go down to the field hoping that I could play kickball with the kids in the neighborhood. And I would be sitting there with the kids that didn't get chosen, that never got chosen to play kickball. We would always be sitting there, you know, but we would stand there when it was time to be picked, but we never got chosen. Those are the kids that I played kickball with. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And eventually I just, you know, I just stopped getting in line to get chosen, you know? So that that's how my self-esteem kind of worked. It, 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 it made me not try to do mm -hmm. anything. It, it, it paralyzed me. Um, and, and that all came from, the the constant uh, the constant promises that were broken that my mom made, you know, always saying I'm gonna come get you and I'm gonna we're gonna do this we're gonna do that and and all those promises being broken, it 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 made me think is there something wrong with me, you know? And I would ask these questions for so long until I was convinced that there had to be something wrong with me. Because if she's going out here and hanging out with all of these people that I'm seeing her hang out with, they must be the cool people and there's something must be just wrong with me. You know, so that that was my mindset. That that was my thought process. And I can imagine that just a constant feeling of rejection. You yeah. know, um, I was I've been reading a lot and watching a lot of different things on trauma and everything and I believe I Ayala Van Zandt you know talked about people who endure trauma um, often carry a promise that's um, from that trauma or healed from that trauma you know and that promise you know typically is carried on into whatever companionship whatever you know, field, whatever thing they do next in life, you know, and they hold people to that. 
Mm-hmm. And I and I and I think you know from all that you endure, you know, especially you know seeing and you know um, constantly feeling like okay, you know, I'm here, you know, I'm waiting for you, you know, and nothing show, no one showing up, and uh, not your mom showing up or what have you, you know that that promise started to form, and I mm-hmm. think you know as you spoke more into you, okay, it didn't work on that grandma, so now you know I'm at um this facility and that didn't take you know now i'm at hawthorne and hawthorne gave some sense of stability but there's still some disruption there come back Mm -hmm. home okay i'm at the place i want to be why is it not going right (laughs) you know this is where i want it to be and you know that promise you know didn't look too good at that time you know and Mm -hmm. And then mom relapsed, you know, um, and, and, and that's a very disappointing moment because now you go back to those thoughts. Mm-hmm. Is it me? Did I do something? You right. know, mm-hmm. um, because that's that's the default, you know, and I know we talked about that before, mm-hmm. that default, you know, it's natural to go back to that default. And, now, and you know what, too, about the relapse, Michael, I didn't know that, I didn't know it was because of that until I got a lot older. Mm. So at the time when she chased me down with that knife and then I could no longer go back home, the thought was she just gave up on me. She just don't want wow. me. So I didn't realize it was because of the relapse until I got way deep in my twenties and I, that I was, I was gone from foster care for a while by the time I learned that. So I have went through the rest of my foster care placement experience with the story that she just gave up on me. She chased me down with the knife and tried to kill me and because she hates my guts. And finally, she just let let them, let them people take me because she didn't want me no more. That was my story. And, you, and, you, and then one thing I want to highlight in this, because we... We don't know how different things that parents do or, you know, uh, people do in our lives impact us. You said that you had said something that, you know, as a kid that wasn't inappropriate, but uh, you didn't have an appropriate relationship. So, right. so your reaction to whatever was said was a reaction to what, you know, whatever was going, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I remember moments because of the lack of relationship of, you know, my parents, you know, being younger, yeah, it probably was real disrespectful, but mm-hmm. also like the respect factor, because I, I had to stay with somebody else. Where was you at? You know, you know, mm-hmm. consciously, you know, and unconsciously, that's where my mind, where, that's where my brain is. So the reaction to certain things, you know, I, I think, you know, necessarily that was just your brain reacting to like who 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 are you to tell you know right. but I think the the breaking point you know and I, I I and if it's fair to say correct me if I'm wrong the breaking point that breaks your heart is being chased down the street with a knife mm-hmm. by the person who's supposed to love you. Right. You know <laughs> you mm-hmm. know um and not really understanding why <laughs> you right. know Right. Um. It is it, it, to give me a whooping, you know, for saying something or to discipline me, but didn't. It looks like you want to kill me, you know. Right. Um, right. So, so mm-hmm. yeah. And from there, went back to Hot Door, you know. Um, bounced around a couple of different placements and what have you. Um, eventually, aged out into uh, semi-independent living. But um, aged out in homelessness. Yeah, and, and um, one thing I want to, you know, uh, touch on is the fact that, you know, you didn't do well in the foster homes. Um, and it, what it seems like how you explained it, the sense of family was very uncomfortable, mm-hmm. you know, um, very uncomfortable. But when you were in the residential facilities and um, institutions, um, it became a sense of normalcy, you know. Uh, it, was sa- it was safer. It was safer mm-hmm. for me. It was safer because I knew. Uh, it was safer because I knew that staff they came and went. They you know they come in and work. They eight hours and they go home. 
I knew that at any moment a staff could quit or there would be a new staff or a new worker, a new, I, I could deal with that. You know, mm -hmm. I could deal with that, um, you know, keeping myself detached from the, you know, the people that worked there. I knew what, I knew what that was all about. But mm -hmm. when I went to the foster homes, I was in a more vulnerable situation with my feelings and my heart and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I fear, I, I constantly feared uh, rejection and I constantly feared, um, you know, being lied to. I constantly feared uh, people not following through with their promises, you know. Uh, but I knew in the placements, I knew the rules, I knew them didn't change. <laughs> I knew I knew the staff. I knew what their boundaries were. You know, I didn't hug staff. I didn't, you know what I'm saying? It, everything mm -hmm. was everything was the way that it was and it didn't change. You know, so that's why I, I that's why I think I dealt with, and I think a, a lot of that too had to do with institutionalization. Mm -hmm. Because it's 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 weird because when I went to prison and I walked in quarantine in Jackson. And it was this big birdcage style setting and it should have scared the crap out of me. But when I walked in quarantine, I was like, okay, this is, this is like placement. You know, it, it, it didn't bother me. It did not bother me at all. Um, so I think a lot of it had to do with institutionalization. Yeah, and um, that's exactly where I was getting to. Um... Is it fair to say that's kind of how you started to conform your life, you know, because it started to be uncomfortable in the foster homes, but this was something that you felt comfortable with. So you start to build your life upon how placements were set up. Is it yep. fair to say that, you know, mm -hmm. so relationships with anybody, it was okay. Temporary. <laughs> you know, yep. Yep. So, um, yep. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, so when you eventually age completely out, you still have built your life in an institutionalization mindset. So mm -hmm. anything thereafter was in this tight little box. Mm -hmm. You know, um, okay, okay. Yeah, um, everybody was, you know, uh, treated at arm's length. Um, there was no, you know, I, I, I worked really hard to keep from being attached to people. Um, there was a lot of isolation in there, even though I'm an a, a, a extrovert. Um, I still was, de you know, keeping myself detached from people, keeping myself detached from my emotions. And, um, just really uh, uh, kind of treating everybody the same, you know, so I can stay in this safe spot that, you know, so I struggled with relationships. I struggled really bad with relationships. Um, you know, and, and when I had my son, I won't get too far in it, but when I had my son, there was some issues, there were some attachment issues at that point when I, had, when I first had him. You know, I had to work hard to allow myself to, to open up that part of my heart that I had locked away. And I said, that would never, that would never come out. You know, I had to work at that, you know? Um, so I didn't mean to go too far ahead with, with no, my son. That's exactly, where, that's, that's exactly where we're headed. You know, now, yeah. now we're getting out of that space of transition out, you know, um, from your adolescence, navigating into your, you know, adulthood. And you spoke about, um, getting incarcerated, you know, mm -hmm. um, at a, a young age. And if you could walk me through the journey of incarceration to, you know, the, the after. So incarceration, when I got in, when I went into prison, um, you know, the only thing that I really hated about prison is I had to be there so long, you know, it was like five years, God, dog, I can't, you know, as far as um, being comfortable in prison, I think I was kind of comfortable there because mm -hmm. I, you know, I had the three meals, I had, you know, I could work out, I could, you know, um, you know, hang around with the fellas and, you know, just chit chat or walk the yard or whatever I was doing, you know, 
Uh, but a part of me still wanted to be out, you know, but, you know, things like, you know, being in a relationship with, with, with women and all that kind of stuff. The stuff that, you know, most men miss when they're incarcerated is the stuff that I basically thought about. Uh, but really, to be honest with you, my, uh, I, I was more free, this might make weird sense, but I was more free in prison than I was when I got out of prison. And I was more free in prison because my relationship with God had, had went to another level. So before I went to prison, I gave my life to Christ. Um, I gave, is it okay to talk about this? You good, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I gave my life to Christ before, shortly before I went to prison. But then shortly after I gave my life to Christ, I was back to doing the old stuff that I was doing. But this was a genuine connection that I had with God, um, mm. you know, when I gave my life to Christ. But when I went to prison, that's when God started working on me, working on my heart, working on uh, challenging my story, you know, um, challenging, you know, the things that I would tell myself and all that kind of stuff. That's where my true deliverance came from when I was in prison. And so I lived most of my life in prison in the Bible and going to Bible studies with other men of God that were in prison and, you know, and, 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 and the volunteers that came to the prisons to teach us the word, you know, from different churches and stuff like that. That's where I spent most of my time. So I was more free in there. I, I, I had gotten to a different maturity level in there. Um, and, you know, it was excitement when I left prison, but at the same time, I was scared, you know. Um, but I, when I left prison, you know, shortly after that, probably about a year after that, I had had a relapse. You know, I started drinking again and, you know, and doing stuff I wasn't supposed to do. And then, you know, I caught a drunk driving ticket and that was the violation of my parole uh, agreement. And I went back to prison for another, I think it was another 14 months or something like that. Um, and then I got out of prison. It was a re when I was in there for the 13 months, it was a reconnection with God. And I got out of prison and I got myself involved in the church and I was away from the community that I was in before. I uh, didn't know anybody but the church people. Um, and then, you know, I just, because I didn't deal with, because I, I didn't deal with the core of my story, I didn't challenge my story that I was telling myself that I wasn't good enough and all that kind of stuff. And I kind of hid behind the Bible um, because I didn't challenge that. Now I'm out and I'm feeling alone and I'm feeling, I'm, you know, I'm increasingly getting depressed and stuff like that to the point where, you know, I needed to do something to, to add some kind of excitement to my life or to um, kind of get my mind off of things. So I started drinking again. And once I started drinking again, it just opened up a whole nother can of worms. And, um, you know, next thing you know, I was back to where I was and worse off. You know, um, I was selling drugs at the time. Um, drinking and smoking weed and partying and doing all this kind of stuff. Um, and then I ended up getting married to somebody that, you know, I probably shouldn't have married in the first place. Um, and then we had a son, which is the blessing that came out of that. Um, and then I got divorced. We got divorced about nine years later, but it was, it was common. It was common. Um, got divorced, but the divorce was highly emotional um it was it was a very hard time in my life became more suicidal and it was because it was because i you know i made a promise that i would never break up the family um because family meant everything to me and not only my perception of what the Bible said about divorce and all that kind of stuff on top of it, 
So when I left my ex-wife for the sake of my recovery, for not using and stuff like that, um, it just, it really, it really put me in a depressed state where I just started thinking about suicide again. Um, and, and, and my purpose, I, I didn't know what my purpose was to be here. You know, and I would constantly ask God, what am I here for? Like, why, why, why didn't you let that guy pull the trigger on me in that one house back in Detroit? Why, why didn't you let me die in that near fatal car accident? Why didn't you, why are you keeping me like this? And, you know, um, er, in early recovery, uh, God spoke to me and one of, and, and, and when I was in a deep depression and I was on that floor trying to figure it out and I, you know, I wanted to kill myself and I was trying to come up with a plan and I was crying and sobbing. Um, the Lord just spoke to me and, and said that, you know, before you was formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I already knew who you were. I knew what, what, what your life was going to be. I knew you were going to be addicted to drugs. I knew all these things about you, but I set you aside and I set you apart for, for specific, specific reasons. And that reason is that I want you to work with foster youth and I want you to help foster youth challenge that the story that they're telling themselves that that keeps them from growing, that keeps them from recovery and that's keeping them from thriving, you know, uh, that's keeping them from healing. And so I ran from the calling. I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to revisit my past. Because in order for me to help other people, I had to have my own recovery. I had to, I had to be transformed before I go out and try to help other people transform their lives. And so I started digging in my recovery and I started learning and I started, I started um, just growing as a person and thriving. And um, that's when I opened up, I finally opened up River Jordan. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. You know, talk about perseverance, resiliency, you know, um, everybody on here that know, know I'm a very spiritual person, you know, faith leads my life in a huge perspective. Um, but to find purpose and, and, and calling through all you have been through and to, to accept it, it's it's uh something I can attest to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because that <laughs> that that running game that we have as alumni, it, mm -hmm. it, it can be clean, like you know, mm -hmm. find yourself mm -hmm. on a whole other side of the country, and then you know, all right, now I got to go back on the west side, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, but truly appreciate you sharing that. Um. You talked about being at a place where you had to submit, you know, mm -hmm. and um, really, you know, testing yourself and taking on the challenge of um, recovery, not only from substances and, you know, alcohol, but recovery um, within the inside of your own trauma. Um, so... I know you started River Jordan. I know that that hasn't been easy, you know, and I want to get into the get into the meat of that. Uh, but before I get into the meat of that, if you can touch on um, your recovery from foster care and what that looks like for other people and how were you able to break it down for yourself to get to a place to um, start River Jordan? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I had to do was um, I had to I had to look at the story that I was telling myself. You know, I was telling myself that you know my mother didn't want me, so she you know put me in foster care, and my grandmother this and all this stuff like that. Just I had the story that nobody wanted me, nobody cared about me, everybody hated my guts, and you know and stuff like that. And I was my own family. And I had to really, I had to go back and get an awareness of why I was really in foster care. I had to know why. 
And once I challenged, once I challenged that and I took a look at it, I found out that um, I was in foster care at no fault of my own because my mother was an addict and because she left me with other with people that she didn't know, strange folks and stuff like that. So I was a neglect case. I was a neglect case. And then I had to understand what drugs do to people. And once I found out, once I understood what drugs do to people and how they how it makes them irresponsible and how it makes them do things that they normally wouldn't do in a million years, then I started to understand that my mother was under the influence of drugs and drugs just makes people do certain things. It wasn't because she didn't love me. And then I had to accept it. And acceptance is just saying, okay, that's life on life's terms. Good things happen to, to, to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. You know, um, I don't get to pick and choose what happens to different folks. You know, I don't get to, I don't get to control my mother's recovery process from, from substance abuse. I just had to accept it, that, that that's how it turned out for her which ultimately, you know, made my life what it was in foster care. Um, and then forgiveness is just letting it go. I had to just say, okay, I am making a choice right now to let things go. It's not saying that I agree with how things turned out. I'm not saying that I agree with her neglecting me or agree with how she did what she did and, and all that or giving her a... a, a, a um, you know, just giving her a pass to say everything was okay. But I have to say that it is okay with how things turned out. I can't do nothing about it and I'm choosing to let it go. So that's my recovery process from, from, from my experiences. But once I really knew the, the real story of it, aside from my assumptions and what I was telling myself, then I was able to change. Because if you look at the comparison from what I told you to, to, to what, I'm, what I'm saying now, those are two different stories. One is the truth and one is not the truth. And so once I, once I learned how to live in the truth of my story, then I was able to challenge that I'm not good enough story. Um, I will never amount to story. Uh, you, you know, and all those things that we tell ourselves to, 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 that makes us not take healthy life risk, that makes us uh, be stagnant and not do anything, that makes us isolate, that makes us all of these things, you know? So that's my recovery process. And I will always be in recovery for the rest of my life. There's certain things that I do that are part of my recovery. I see a therapist once a month. Um, now during the holiday seasons, which is a which is triggersome for me, I see my therapist twice a month, and that's going to happen from November till right around January ish. You know, um, I do take a low dosage anxiety medication um, because I, I happen to be a thinker. You know, I'll lay in bed and the wheels will keep turning in my head, and I won't never get no sleep. So, you know, I, I take in low, low doses of anxiety medication. I go to church. I have, I have my relationship with God is the number one priority in my life. Um, I go to the gym. I, I try, to, try to eat right. Um, so all of those things working together is my recovery. And those things are going to happen for the rest of my life. Now, as far as other people's recovery goes, uh, what we do here at River Jordan is we try to get people to challenge their story. Uh, awareness, understanding, acceptance, and forgiveness. And once they can do that, then they can figure out what maintenance works for them, whether it's medication management or therapy or going to church or whatever, we can help them find out what maintenance piece works for them. But they have to, they have to go through the awareness, understanding, acceptance, and forgiveness piece before they can do anything else. 
Definitely. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, before we dive too deep into River Jordan, I want to highlight the fact that you said in your recovery and in recovery in, in general for people who have experienced trauma, it starts with self, you yeah. know? It's a, it, 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 and, and it's a self process to really get to that place of awareness. Okay, I need to take this process on. And then as you get into the process, building some people that can help you with accountability, have that fellowship with in that state of recovery and, and, and change of scenery, change of environment, help you stay on that road of recovery. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and that's something that I hear, you know, you saying in your own recovery, but also, you know, as I know the work that is done at River Jordan, you know, um, it's what um, we try to do, you know, mm-hmm. and, and setting the standard of, okay, you, when you ready to step into recovery, we gonna you, you're gonna be there, you know. And the, the the first part of that is a journey with self because you have to, you know, accept the fact that okay, I got some things I need to work through to be in a better place, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and then once you're there, you're not by yourself, you know. Oh, <laughs> well, you're not by yourself, you know. You have a huge community of alumni across the world, but also, you know, um, you can find yourself a church community. You can find yourself if if church is your thing, a community of positive individuals, you know, <laughs> um, and stuff like that. But giving yourself that change of environment, that change of scenery, um, is more most important because if that environment is conducive to you living a lifestyle that um helps you suppress you know, the truth of your story or mm-hmm. helps you um, continue with the lie um, that you've been giving yourself, then it's not going to help you in the long run. Your recovery right. is always going to be that teetering, that teetering block where you good one day and you bad the next day, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, and not saying that recovery is linear because it's definitely not, but um, in more ways in the process of processing things, you know, you can do mm-hmm. things in a step where it's come off seamlessly linear, but it's not. And I right. said that you ain't gonna have those moments in forgiveness where you're gonna go back and be like, I don't know if I can fit, forgive this person. Or right. in those places of acceptance or understanding that you're not gonna go back and be like, mm, I don't really understand why this person did this. Or I, I don't think I can accept. But mm-hmm. in, in, in that place of doing the motions, mm-hmm. it can definitely be a place where it's consistent, right. you know? Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, recovery is definitely uh, a revolving thing, you know, mm-hmm. that you have to do every day. You know, you get up every day, you, you're you you're aware, you understand, you accept, and you forgive, you know. Um, definitely. Forgiveness is, forgiveness is something we got to do every day, all day to keep ourselves purged. We can, we can drive out. You know, I can go out of this parking lot and get on the street and somebody cut me off. I got to forget that person. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or, or, or a lady cuss me out in line because she in there too long or something, whatever it might be. Or somebody here cuss me out because I didn't, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> I got to forgive. You know, you got to forgive and keep yourself purged because if you don't, um, it just builds up on the inside of you and, and resentment and all that kind of stuff. All that's poison. Mm-hmm. And, and, and one thing I would say, it, it's fair to say that, you know, recovery and all these steps, you know, understanding things, you know, from a different lens, accepting things for what they are, you know, um, forgiveness and uh, all these, those are life skills. Mm-hmm. You know, those are life skills. We we talk about them in in a self care and a mental health sense of you know um, living, but also those are life skills. So once you learn them, you know it, it's like muscle memory. You mm-hmm. know, not saying that it won't be hard, but once you learn them and you really get them down, you know, um, you're able to run through it. And and then you start to see, as you were mentioning, that, oh, forgiveness isn't just about my trauma. I need to forgive people on a daily basis. On a when daily basis. When they cut me off, when they cut me off, when they cut, when they, when, when the person over here won't help me with my beer, or, you know, all of these other things that we, we get mad at or someone does something wrong to us. We, we start to see that it's not just in this aspect of our life, that it's in a holistic point. Mm-hmm. But, um, I want to push forward, you know, into River Jordan, you know, and what that entails and what is the work going on and um, what is the mission? So the mission is empowering individuals impacted by foster care to thrive. 
Uh, so what that means is um, empowering them, empowering them is to empower them to advocate for themselves, empower them to go out and do the work that they need to do to get their lives back on track, empower them to, to um, get in line with the recovery principles, awareness, understanding, acceptance, and forgiveness, empowering them to, you know, find maintenance uh, maintenance tools to use, you know, in their recovery that they can, you know, carry on for a lifetime, um, empowering them to even talk to their workers and, you know what I'm saying? So just empowering them um, to thrive, to grow, to continue to evolve, you know, and not be stagnant um, in, in a place of, of, of isolation or a place of depression or a place of anxiety you know, and stuff like that. Um, so empowering them to thrive and grow. Um, our programming is, you know, transitional housing is a, is a small piece of it, but uh, your, your uh, pre-aging out wraparound support services like peer support and um, life skill coaching and then that continuum care of peer support and life skill coaching, no matter, regardless of the age, those are the most important pieces of our program. And this whole um, recovery model that we have that our programming is based on, uh, that, would, that would be the foundation of our program. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So, you know, what I'm hearing is, you know, you people transition out and people who haven't transitioned out have access to your program. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and by having access, you know, they can access transitional housing, which is 18 to 21. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, from from what I understand, that's an 18 month program, you know, yeah. giving them a window, even if, you know, they get there, they do it successfully, you know, um, and they're still in that window of 18, 21, they can come back and apply again if things didn't work out, you know, mm -hmm. and what have you. And you have a male and female house right now. Um, yeah, just giving them a, a safe place to land when they leave foster care or if they get out there, they've left foster care and they, you know, try to make it on their own and things didn't work out for them. You know, they mm -hmm. can apply to, you know, enter into our transition housing program and, and, you know, do the 12 or 18 months or whatever they need to do, you know, until they're they're ready to get out there on their own. So. Uh, we do recommend, you know, 12 months at least, uh, but no longer than 18 months. Definitely, definitely. And um, what 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 would be the basis of this, like, program, you know, the meat, you know, of it all? Like, when they get there is, you know, um, is it just, like, another placement? Like, what what is it, you know, like? Yeah, so this is uh, basically, you know, I, I always uh, compare it to, you know, leaving mom's house at 18 years old and, you know, things don't work out. And so you need to come back and, you know, get yourself together and get out there and try it again. It is not a, a uh, independent living plus program. It's not a SIL supervised independent living program or nothing like that. This is just a house for you to come to. Um, that you share uh, an environment with people who have been in foster care before who are in transition. Um, it is for adults. Everyone here is adults. You know, they're 18 to 21 years old. Um, we, you know, we, we strongly suggest that, you know, the individuals that come here don't come here with a placement mindset. Although that, that's, that's really hard not to do when you've come from placement. And you, you know, it's, you know, you're early in getting out on your own. Uh, it could be, it could be a challenge, but we're here to help those people uh, switch that mindset from, you know, placement to being out on their own. So. Definitely, um, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Now, um, also, you talked about community-based supports, you know, um, what does that look like and how do you support those individuals who may still realistically be in environments that 
aren't conductive to their recovery. Um, we su just supporting them by giving them a safe, uh, a safe place to be um, that promotes recovery, um, mm -hmm. that speaks the language of recovery. Um, you know, this is a place that is not located in, you know, the hood or in a in a in a rough area. It's a, you know, we we pride ourselves on um, a gold standard. Um, environment a clean environment you know where our where our places are centrally located around buses and job opportunities and stuff like that um so is that did i answer that definitely definitely okay. and i would and i'll even share for the audience you know because uh, i i work with river jordan um the biggest component to that community-based you know support is the peer support you know um and that I think is the the strongest component because we have people come in and out and phase from life skills. Some some days they just want to come in and relax, you know, be outside of what their norm is, or if they're not clicking with their foster parent, you know, to just be in a place where they can just relax, do homework, or you know, just feel, you know, um, and what have you. But that's when peer support comes in. And if you don't mind, um, and I'll share a little bit about what is the importance of peer support and why is it significant, you know, that um, foster youth have one? Yeah, so peer support is a model that we did not invent. Um, it's a model that's been around for years. It's a best practice model and it's proven to work in many, with many different populations. Uh, peer support I remember peer support stuff when I was in placement back in 1985. I remember mm -hmm. then, but that's placement. But peer support now, uh, it, it kind of started out with the, uh, the substance use disorder uh, population. Um, peer support is somebody who has transformed their life and now they're going to help someone else transform their life. So it is a person who, uh, for substance use disorder, it is somebody who uh, used drugs before and now they have, you know, they're in recovery, they have enough recovery time and a recovery capital under their belt. And now they wanna go out there and help someone who, uh, who is struggling to recover or is in early recovery and need that mentorship and that, uh, you know, that kinship with someone who's been through it. Um, and they have that for um, veterans. They have peer support for people who have mental health disorders. Uh, they have peer support for, now they're working on a peer support program for people who have, uh, who have uh, lost their children uh, through CPS and um, has since turned their life around and now they've gotten their kids back. So they have uh, mothers and fathers who have been in that situation helping mothers and fathers that are going through that situation. So that's why it's so important with uh, foster youth because, you know, just think about it, Michael, like when you were going through foster care and you were, uh, you were with these, uh, you know, foster care workers and therapists and, and staff and stuff like that. And they were talking about talking to you about things that you should be doing and stuff like that. And, you, you know, we, a lot of times we look at them like, you don't know what I've been through. You don't, you know, how can you say I should be doing this or how I should be doing that? And you ain't never been through what I've been through. And so it's hard for them. I know for me, it was hard for me to really listen to somebody who hasn't been through what I've been through, you know. Um, and so we're seeing um, we're seeing people who have been in foster care really taking to those that have been through their situation before, and really can can zero in and focus on on a conversation with somebody who has been in foster care and now they're out on their own and they're doing well and they're thriving. So that's that's basically where that peer support model comes from. Thank you for sharing that. 
you know, um, and you guys know as um, the audience, you know, uh, I've done a lot of advocacy surrounding peer support um, and also um, uh, parent partners, you know, because um, I'm a person that firmly believe, you know, if we can catch people at the door, we can preserve families. There can be a lot more prevention, you know, uh, some, fam some families still may continue to have you know, that breakage and, and and more importantly, it may be needed, you know, but uh, more families can be saved, you know, by us, you know, helping and stepping in in a different light. Because what we see in today, you know, at least in the state of Michigan where I am, um, is that the first person to they encounter is a CPS worker. You know, what is the, what if that is still the case? But the second person that you encounter, you know, for a parent or and for that kid, you know, is that peer support, that person who has been where you were, you know, um, and can walk and navigate that forever for whatever that time is. So what that means is a kid, you know, that, OK, CPS has removed them, you know, um, they second encounter is with a peer support you know, that is employed by the state or whatever agency, you know, and from that moment on, they're walking with that youth to um, decompress and unpack all that just happened, but the next steps of what is going to happen. That's the same thing for a parent, you know, the, se the second person that they encounter is a parent partner, you know, their kid just got removed. That person can help them de decompress and understand why did the kid get removed? and how they can get their kid back, you know, and, and so forth. And that's how we can bat things from both ends, you know, um, not really, not really saying one person or this person is right, but given each person, you know, whether it be the state, or whether it be the kid, it be the mm -hmm. kid, or whether it be the parent, the best tool to be successful. And that's what all that that's what it really boils down to, you know, um, and what have you, because I know, there's a lot of different stigmas. People have their guards up. People have their bridges where they're like, I don't mess with the people, you know, other, other stuff. It's a neutral ground when it comes to parent partners and um, peer support, just doing the best thing for the individual, you know, and helping them get to a place of sustainability and thriving as we spoke about. Um, I only have a couple more questions for you, Al. I, I really appreciate your time and sharing you know, your individual story and the great work that you're doing with River Jordan. Um, my first to last question is what advice would you like to leave here today? And this can be categorically to uh, different people you work with or just in general. Oh, uh, well, I got so much to say on that, but um my advice would be uh, to speak into alumni specifically, uh, foster care alumni and those who are going through foster care. Um, mental health is everything. I know people don't, I know there's a lot of stigma associated with mental health. I know uh, most of us have had bad experience with mental health, whether you know, you're at a placement and they're making you take your medication and if you don't take it, there's negative consequences and stuff like that. But if you don't deal with your mental health right now, you will, I promise you, deal with it later. You will deal with it later. And if you deal with it later, you have to, you have to understand that you're going to have a lot of wreckage leading up to that. You're going to ruin a lot of things leading up to that because you haven't taken care of yourself when it comes to your mental health. Um, so I just, I just want to give that piece of advice um, and to advocate for yourselves when it comes to mental health. If there's a medication that you're on that, that, that you don't like because it's making you feel a certain way or, or whatever like that, you have to speak up about it. You have rights, you have rights. Um, and Michael can tell you all about your rights. Um, so you have rights as an individual, um, whether you're 15 years old or 10 years old or five years old or whatever, or you have your rights. Um, so I, I just wanna strongly encourage you to take care of your mental health um, and whatever that might be, it could be you know medication management, it could be therapy, 
if you don't like your therapist, you need to speak up. If you don't like your therapist, um, and not you don't like your therapist because they're telling you the truth, okay? I'm talking about if you don't like your therapist because you know, they got you all mixed up and they, you know, they're telling you stuff that that's not working for you or whatever like that. Or they're trying to, you know, shove medication down your throat that's not going to help you out. That's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Not because it, it, the conversation got hard, you know. Um, and, you know, explore things like working out and, and or, or eating healthier or going to church or meditating or Buddha, whatever it is that you are reading or whatever it is, do something that, that can, that can help your brain um, recover from this because this is a lifelong journey. It's a lifelong journey. Um, the other piece of advice that I have for you is to get you a peer support person, somebody who's been through foster care, somebody that you can look at and say, I want to be like that. That's my point of reference right there. You know, I want to be like that or better. You know, I, I want to have good recovery under my belt. I want to forgive people. Whatever it is that attracts you to that person that's positive, that's been in foster care before, find you somebody like that. And if you can't find nobody, we can help you find somebody. You can call River Jordan, 989-391-4046 and talk to somebody and we can we can probably help you uh, find somebody and, and pair you with somebody. So don't go at this alone because there's very few people that understand what we've been through. And the only people that really understand what we've been through are other people who have been through it. Thank you for that. I couldn't have said it better, truly. Um, my last question is any last comments and this is you got any rap songs a book you know come, uh, coming <laughs> out or how people can follow you or how people who people can connect with the work that you're doing and I want to emphasize you know we're getting towards you know giving giving season you know giving Tuesday and all these other things you know um, River Jordan is a nonprofit that, you know, I, 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 I work with so many different, you know, uh, groups and agencies, but, you know, I want to make sure, you know, I'm utilizing my platform to the best of my ability, you know, um, River Jordan is a, is a program that, you know, it's small, but it's mighty and, you know, truly it has the, the greatest intentions for these youth, you know, and um, really helping people get to a place of thriving. So if you're thinking about anything during this holiday season, and I was going to speak to this, you know, um, think about River Jordan and the aspect of donating and giving back to this community, you know, and if so, these people would love to connect with you, follow what you're doing, mm -hmm. or donate, you know, how could they do so? So uh, you can follow, uh, you know, our page, River Jordan Inc. on Facebook. Um, that's that's a way um, I have my own Facebook page to um, Aileen Stamps. There's only one Aileen Stamps in the world. So um, if you put me in the search, you know, God made me unique enough to have my own name that nobody else has. So, you know, it, it'll pop right up there for you. Um, and also, uh, you know, it's, it is giving season. And I just want to point this out to you. Um, it costs $200,000 to run this whole organization. I'm talking about transitional housing for, for, um, for 14 individuals, okay? Two houses, all the utilities, the whole transitional housing program, the peer support, the life skill coaching the administration building and all the utilities involved with that, all of the office supplies and, uh, you know, all of everything that we have going on here. And that is a, that is a very low, low number, um, but we're making a huge impact. And, you know, I'm not asking you to give $200,000. Um, that would be nice, but I'm not asking you to give it. Um, but if we had enough people that would subscribe to donating or to pledge to donate a certain amount of money every month, we can get there if we had enough people, you know, um, $25 a month, you know, $50 a month, $100 a month. Um, 
you know, uh, three, uh, 300, I think it's 367 people donating uh, $50 a month could get us there, you know. Um, you know, so just just things like that, just being that residual income. If if it's if it's a one and done for you, that's fine. You know, we appreciate any amount of money uh, that you donate to us, but we are community funded right now. We don't have state contracting because we, you know, there's things that uh, about our program or things that we do in our program that um, are not lined up with state contracting because. You know, to be honest with you, those things that has not worked for years, and we're seeing the closing of SIL program, Independent Living Plus programs, are that have that have been in existence for years are closing because those programs are not working, and so, you know, we have to create that. We have to show that data that our program is working. And we need we need community to help us uh, keep running. Definitely. And, and might I add, you know, one of the biggest reasons River Jordan doesn't have state funding is because they work with older youth, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the sad reality. A lot of programs, a lot of organizations that work with older youth, you know, outside of why that funding for the individual youth, there isn't any kind of support or funding for uh, programs assisting these youth or what have you. Um, which is something that truly, you know, um, with enough voices, with enough people advocating, that can be changed. You know, there can be federal grants to assist, you know, nonprofits like River Jordan and what have you. Um, but I want to thank you um, truly for being on. And one thing, you know, highlighting, you know, it's awesome to be able to work with, you know, another, you know, um, African American, you know, male who have successfully, you know, and I use the word successful lightly because, you know, success can be taken so many different ways, you know, but, you know, um, has exit out and, and, and that is living in their own sense of thriving. You know, it's, um, monumental for myself to continue to see this as I've been interviewing, you know, I've been able to talk with a select few, you know, of people, um, especially a, a lot of people that look like me, you know, males and what have you who make it out. And that's something that it's a conversation for a whole nother day, but it's not a lot of us, you know, so um, I just want to commend you on the work that you're doing to give back and be in that representation for us, you know, in the community and in this area. Um, and thank you for your time. Yeah, to the audience, you know, um, I know we talked about a lot on this episode, and um, I, I don't want to be remiss by saying that if something in this episode has triggered you, please don't just sit in that, you know, um, take some time before you go do anything else to get back in baseline, center yourself, do some mindfulness exercises. If it's something that's triggered you and it's thought provoking, don't just sit in that either. You know, I'm here, you know, uh, my contact information is tied to my podcast. If you're looking to get connected with resources or peer support, you know, as um, Al mentioned, you know, his the number is there, the website is there, connect with him. You know, if you're looking for just resources with mental health, I'm more than willing to help you out, you know, and connect you with that, you know, but don't let, you know, something that has provoked something in your thought process to something that you have been through or whatever you're going through go on deaf ears you know it was a reason why it you know tickled your it tickled your ears or what have you you know uh whether you have started that process or left that process behind or you kind of stagnant in that process don't sit in it alone you know if anything came out of this conversation is that you know it's good to have supports you know it's good to have that additional backing you know through going through things we all need that sense of a village and that village looks unique to everyone you know but we all need that sense of a village to continue to thrive in life um that being said it's um winter is coming around the corner it's cold and flu season covid is still out there please take care of yourself 
You know, I know um, a lot of people have lost their life due to COVID, you know, and stuff like that. So I really want to drill it in and use my platform to let you guys know to be safe out there. If you need to put that mask back on, put that mask back on, carry a little uh, thing, a hand sanitizer or what have you. But please be safe out there because it takes all of us. We all are part of this big old village, you know, called America. So we all are taking care of each other by taking care of our individual selves. And last but not least, you know. I'm getting ready to end season two. I'm at 70 something episodes with season one and season um, two uh, together. I will be taking a break and ending the season um, and the end of December. Uh, what that will look like, I'll be taking Resilient Voices and Beyond um, and making a movement and an initiative in the community. That is my goal to, to be able to take this and have those conversations in those communities uh, where we're seeing, you know, a lot of kids being taken and put into the system, where we're seeing, you know, a lot of deficits between um, CPS and the community or the educational system and just have those thought provoking conversations, you know, um, and hopes to make transformative change. I don't know what's going to come out of it. I just feel led to do that. Um, and most of you guys know me, I'm never going to stop advocating, you know, I may uh, get off the grounds because, you know, I'm getting older, <laughs> but I'm never going to stop advocating. But this has been season two. Uh, this has been season two, episode 21 um, of Resilient Voices and Beyond. I hope you guys have a good night, good morning, good whatever you're listening to this. Thank you and talk to you guys soon.